My name is Maddie Anholt. I'm a writer, actor and comedian and I recently narrated the audiobook version of Art of Death, which is the first in the Mindful Detective series by Lawrence Anholt. And Lawrence Anholt also happens to be my dad. So I'd like to introduce you to Lawrence Anholt. Hello. Hello, daughter Maddie. <laughs> Hello, Poppy. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about Art of Death today for Lyme Crime. Yeah. Um, and so, so first of all, let's start, start talking about the, um, the kind of framework, the writing of the book. Um, without giving too much away, tell us about the premise of the series. Right. Do you want the short version or the long version or both? Well, we're aiming for a 20 to 30 minute interview. So. <laughs> okay. Well, short, short version, Buddhist cop who feels too much. Uh, longer version. Uh, these are stories about an unlikely detective duo who consist of uh, a, a, a man named Vincent Kane, also known as Veggie Cop, who is a Buddhist cop who lives in a cabin on the Undercliffs, um, just outside Lyme Regis. All of the stories are set in the west of England uh, and uh, all of the events take place in this part of the world where I happen to be living and sitting right now. Yes. And his unlikely partner is um, Shanti Joyce, who has recently located from um, Camden Town, where a case went wrong. And they're brought together, but they're very, very different people. Um, he is um, intuitive, a very reluctant cop. Every crime that happens upsets him deeply, but he has these intuitive skills which are essential in solving the crimes. She is... Uh, witty, dynamic, a bit cynical, a bit world weary, a single mum, a feminist. Uh, and so there's a lot of friction between the two of them. But also, Maddie, there's a little frisson. Yeah, which was fun to, because obviously playing these for the audiobook, you know, I had to really get into the characters. We are going to talk later about how to build characters. Now, I read a, um, a, a quote, a description of uh, this, which said, that uh, Art of Death is, uh, has been described as Fargo meets Broadchurch. Oh, I like that. What does that mean? <laughs> I like that. Um, I think it might be my agent who said that, actually. Um, Fargo meets Broadchurch. Well, I think the thing about it is the Broadchurch bit, obviously, is that it's set in the same part of the world. Broadchurch was filmed just along the coast here. Uh, it's an incredibly um, beautiful and wild and visual part of the world. That's the, bridge part, uh, that's, the, um, that's the broad church part of it. Um, the Fargo bit, well, these books have a slightly, how would you describe it, Maddie? Sort of surreal quality to them. They're fairly wacky. Um, they're, 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 they're quite bizarre. They've got a sort of um, uh, dreamlike quality to them to a certain extent. So although they're crime procedurals uh, and, and they're based on logic, there, there's a little bit of magic realism to them, I like to think. Um, and you spoke there, you mentioned your agent, uh, Madeleine Milburn, brilliant literary agent. The brilliant best. literary agent. <laughs> the best, I think, um, apart, from, apart from mine. Um, so how, <laughs> how did you actually come up, because it's such a, a huge idea, how did you come up with the idea? Who was involved? Well, as you know, better than anyone on the planet, Maddie, um, I spent the last 30 years really um, uh, writing and illustrating children's books. I've done about 200 children's books. Um, and uh, that's the way I've made my living. Uh, you know, strangely, um, that all started when you were babies, you and your siblings were babies. I started doing baby board books with, with your mum, uh, Catherine Anhol, and it sort of grew from there. We've done many, many children's books. And then as you guys grew older, we found ourselves sort of um, quite organically working our way up the age range. So we went from baby board books, we started writing picture books. I wrote a series about great, um, and illustrated a series about great artists for kids. And then it went all the way through to early fiction, seriously silly stories. Uh, I've done some young adult fiction, a book called The Hypnotist, um, which came out a few years ago. And then when you guys left and flew and spread your wings and went into the world, um, I, I, I thought to myself, now what do I really want to do? And all my life I've been a reader. I've loved reading uh, fiction more than anything else really. And I had a dream to write full length novels. 
And then after discussions with several people, including um, my agent and, and various friends, I started thinking about crime. Now, crime's not really my um, natural um, territory. I don't read a lot of crime, but my agent convinced me that actually that might be some kind of an advantage because I'd be more likely to come up with something original, something unusual. Uh, and that has proved to be the case. The difficult part has been um, the research involved with the police procedure and so on, which um, has been incredibly time consuming because something I, I didn't know very much about. But yet, in the end, you all turn to crime. And um, who, who, were, who were some of the people? So Paddy was involved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let me mention, let, let me mention um, uh, the legendary Paddy McGrain. Um, Paddy is a good friend of mine, lives nearby. Um, hello, Paddy. Uh, Paddy is an author uh, and um, a psychotherapist and also the creator of this fantastic Lime Crime Festival of which we are a part. And in the early stages of this series, Paddy and I worked quite closely together. He helped me formulate and shape a lot of the uh, ideas, absolutely uh, amazing input. And at one time we did think about co-writing the series, but for various reasons we found that, that that wouldn't work. And so Paddy went off and has done his own uh, fantastic books. And, um, and, and I've stayed with the Mindful Detective and um, I'm now on book three, which I'll tell you about a little bit later. Um, and published by Little Brown. Published by Constable, which is part of um, Little Brown. They're doing a, a fantastic job. And we're also getting um, uh, all kinds of... Uh, the, the, the books are only just out a few months ago. The first book, Art of Death, right here, um, was out um, just a few months ago. And it's doing really well. We've got um, various foreign language editions, Czech, Danish, German, and a few others in the pipeline and some other exciting things which I may or may not reveal. Yeah, we'll, we'll perhaps talk about that later. Now I asked this question mainly for me as I'm just about to possibly to start my first foray into writing myself. Mm. How long does it take you to write a book? <laughs> how long does it take me or how long does it take you? Well, it takes me a lot shorter because I... I yeah. You write incredibly fast. It's extraordinary. No, I'm a very slow writer. Um, I have to say, the, 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 the novel I'm working on at the moment, which is the third in the Mindful Detective series, Solstice of Death, set at the um, uh, midwinter um, solstice at Stonehenge, has taken me about 18 months and I'm still not finished. And that's uh, all day, every day. Uh, I'm a very slow writer. Um, why? Uh, because I want to do it as well as I possibly can. I'm a bit of a, I mean, I don't, you know, I want to blow my own trumpet, but I, I am a perfectionist and every sentence for me has to be polished. I have to be really happy with the structure. It takes a long time. I mean, I'm used to doing picture books, which also can take a very long time, especially if you're illustrating them. So for me, you know, as I keep, you, you, you're asking me all the time about writing, because as you say, you're um, working on your first book now, which is going to be great. Um, and, and I always say the old cliche, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so yeah, about 18 months. Um, okay, yeah, no, that's really helpful. So let's talk about, um, so obviously I read uh, the book, I read mm -hmm. Art of Death, um, and then it was later on that we, we started having discussions about um, the audio book when um, Audible, mm -hmm. you know, wanted it as an audio, audio book. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a little bit about building characters and the audio book itself. Yeah, well, you know, um, we were going to do an audio book and for me it was really important that we had the right narrator and um, so we tried a couple of actors and um, actually one actor recorded the the entire book and I was so unhappy with it because it just didn't the, the thing I should say about these books is they're very much character led aren't they there are a whole range of characters besides um, Kane and Shanti my two detectives there are, what, probably 30 characters in, in that first book, and they're all very different and very distinct. And for me, when I'm writing them, they become quite real. And so I needed someone who could really bring these characters to life. And um, so I thought about it, and I thought about it, and then I thought, hang on a minute, I've got a daughter who, who, who's an actor who can do uh, really fantastic voices. So 
I pitched the idea to, um, to, to, to the studio who were making the audio book and they said, well, fine, but she'll have to um, audition the same as everyone else. And damn me, she got the part. And, um, and fantastic it is too, Maddie. You know, I really think that you, that you catch those characters so brilliantly. So um, uh, what does Shanti sound like? Well, yeah, I mean, there were so many, I, uh, so many, I mean, I, I, I made my living for about five, six years as a character comedian. And one of my shows, I had 16 voices in an hour. So I thought, oh, well, I'm quite used to doing this, but this book was, <laughs> was like nothing I'd ever done. So um, you've got Shanti, who is, um, she's a little bit like this, and she's very straightforward. She speaks quite quickly, um, and uh, she doesn't take any bullshit. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. Shanti wouldn't care. She would just do it anyway. All right, so she's, she's quite like this, um, and she's very tired of Vincent. Shut up, Vincent. Like, she's very tired. She's a little bit Essexy. And the one, um, the one that I found difficult, actually, funny enough, was Vincent Kane. Um, of all of them. We, we, we spent ages talking about what, what Vincent Kane uh, sounded like. And the weird thing about it was, do you remember we had this discussion about what Vincent Kane, this, this, is, this is Veggie Cop, this is the mindful detective himself. We had long discussions, didn't we, about what his voice would be like. And I realised at, at a particular point, I think, that he is me he's my inner voice and so i heard him as my own voice so i didn't really know what he sounded like we had a lot of trouble and people made all sorts of suggestions at one time someone said he should sound like um uh, the character from the young ones i started trying to learn that and then we i i once then did a recording where he was like absolutely like west country like this he was meant to go but the thing is he's, he's and i this sounds now very freudian because of what you just said but he's meant to be quite a sexy character yeah. he's meant to have a little uh, alluring something about him and he's a bit like he's a bit like joe wicks but very vegetarian <laughs> yeah wicks, yeah yeah well exactly and then um you know i found what there's a, a brilliant character called uh, marlene who is like uh, it's quite difficult to get a voice She's like a little smoker, like and oh, how lovely you've come along. And it's not even quite right because I haven't done there in so long. But there's all sorts of these kind of like huge big characters. What we found was these characters have got to be, um, they've got to be real. You know, they are, even though some of them are there for comedic value, because it is a very funny book, as well as it being Yeah, but humor is, humor is an important part of these series, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but then we found that they've got to, they've got to be real. You've really got to be real. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of, I mean, the actual recording of, let's talk about the process of the recording, um, because audiobooks are so huge now. Um, and I know that, so I received a big brown envelope with the uh, book printed out, A4 pages, and I went through painstakingly highlighting. I found, I don't, I had to go and buy loads of different highlighters because there was about, I think I counted 36 different characters, different voices. So Did you build me for the highlighters? <laughs> no, but I should do. Um, and I, I went through and um, yeah, highlighted them all. And then finally on the day of the recording, it took a week I think it was just over a week to um, sit there in the studio all day. So you start about 9 a.m. and you finish about six with headphones on. And we were, I had a brilliant producer called Gavin Osborne sitting um, in the studio opposite me. And that rapport between the actor, the performer and the producer is really vital because you want to get a flow. You want to get an energy. You want to just, you know, keep going. And of course, sometimes you stumble, sometimes you mispronounce words or whatever and Gavin was really good at you know not hold so he'd let me get to the end of sentences and then stop me and say let's just go back and do this so he was never saying oh you did that wrong um and it so he was we, that was a really great working relationship that we had um now I I've had a sneaky read of the next two books Lauren yeah and and, and but before we just get on to the next two books, I, I must say, actually, Manny, the first time I heard the audio book, because it's what, about eight and a half hours long, isn't it? Yeah. And I had no idea what it would be like. And uh, I went out, I was doing some gardening and I put my headphones on and I got completely lost in it. And, and what I must say is that you, you, 
you um, don't overdo the voices. You know, it's very, very steady, very enjoyable, uh, very entertaining, and I recommend it to all my friends. Um, uh, yeah, so now let's talk, well, let's talk about the setting, storyline, and suspense, as I have definitely not yeah. prepared. Um, so you went, this is what I was really interested in. So I don't want to, I'm not going to give away the plot, but um, the we open, uh, it's, Let's say um, an art school is 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 a, uh, we start. So we're talking about book one. This is art of death. This is this one yeah. right here. Yeah. Now um, the plot is dark and devilish. Now were, were you inspired by something you'd seen at art school? Yeah. So uh, book one is um, is is set in a, um, a, a an art gallery in in Somerset. Um, and um, I don't know how much to give away, really. Well, it starts off with a retrospective show of a performance artist, and she is found dead in a bizarre and horrible way at her own um, retrospective private view. And um, Shanti and Kane meet for the first time, obviously, in that book, and they're brought in to solve this murder. And book one takes place in the world of art, hence the title, Art of Death, in the world of contemporary fine art, and they have to delve back into the life of this, um, uh, she's a Danish performance artist, and um, they go back to her original art school days at Falmouth School of Art, which by a very strange coincidence is where I did my degree in fine art many, many years ago. And, um, and so, yeah, an awful lot of it came from my own experiences there. Uh, it was a wonderful place, a sort of hotbed of creativity um, down in Falmouth. Back then it was a very, small um, art school and um, yeah, great, great years. And, um, and so, yeah, a lot of the inspiration came from there. But yeah, it's set in the world of, of fine art. So anyone who's interested in fine art and loves the West Country uh, will enjoy it. I mean, you know, even if they're not interested in fine art or the West Country, I find that they're, and, I'm, and I know maybe perhaps I'm slightly biased, but there is really nothing like this book. It is so unusual and so, uh, I found it, I remember the, I mean, I'm a fast reader anyway, but I remember I said this to you, I'd missed stop. Not only had I missed my stop on the tube, I'd almost also finally, when I got back to the right stop, then also missed my stuff on the, on the bus because I was so engrossed in this storyline. I mean, I mean, there's been quite a lot of people, a lot of people who've read it, who've said the same thing, that it really is not to be, you know, to use the old, uh, I couldn't put it down, but really it is one of those books that you just can't put down. Um, Thanks, I'll, um, I'll put the hundred quid into your bank account when the interview is finished. Thank you so much. Um, now, obviously I grew up in Lyme Regis because you're my dad, um, but I grew up in Lyme Regis too, and it's set in the beautiful surrounds of, of Lyme Regis. Is there a reason why you've chosen, aside from you living there, is there a reason why you've chosen to set it there? Yeah, there are many reasons. Um, yeah, the, fir the first thing is, is, is just a, a simple uh, practical thing, which is that the book before, which was my young adult novel, was set in the deep south of America in the 1960s, with the background of civil rights and the Ku Klux Klan and everything, which was an extraordinary world to research, an extraordinary world to write about. But obviously it was completely impractical to, to, to go to that part of the world and I couldn't go back in time. And by the end of that book, I just thought, right, the next book, whatever it is, I'm going to set locally. Mm -hmm. And then I began to realise, I mean, my goodness, what an extraordinary part of the world this is. Um, where I'm sitting right now, we live just at Sideline Ridge on the, on the Devon-Dorset border. And you can walk from here um, along the Jurassic Coast. Um, it's, it's extraordinarily beautiful. And it's, I think, the closest thing to rainforest that we've got in the, in the UK. Mm -hmm. You walk along the footpath there and um, because the land is very unstable, it's slipping all the time. And it means that nothing can be built there. And it gives it a very wild, twisted quality. And I actually had a friend who for a time lived in a cabin uh, on the undercliffs. And I used to go and visit him. He had no electricity. Uh, it was extraordinarily uh, atmospheric. And I sat there, this is many years ago, I used to sit there in his cabin. And I thought, one day, <laughs> this place is going to pop up in a, in a book. And so that's where Vincent Kane lives. And the other thing to say about it is because of the impermanence of this crumbling um, landscape, 
it's reflective of his his Buddhist beliefs about impermanence. I mean, Buddhism is a is a very important strand within mm. the story, and and uh, something I've been interested in for a very very long time. Yeah. So the landscape, the impermanence of the landscape, reflects his um, his his beliefs about the impermanence of life. I like that. Smart. Yeah. I um, thought about it. I thought about it. See. <laughs> Um, now, Vincent Gehane is, is a Buddhist cop, um, yeah. and, um, you know, I, I wanted to know really how, because you are, you are Buddhist, I would say, you are, you are definitely a meditator, and um, I wanted to know how important is his spirituality in the book, and why you have chosen for him to be Buddhist? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Buddhism is something I'm, I'm, I've always I've been interested in it for a very very long time, as you know. I mean, uh, Buddhist philosophy I think is incredibly rich. Um, Buddhism for me is a kind of um, a, a toolkit for life. You, you when you look in Buddhism, there is a way of looking at almost any situation. I mean, this extraordinary time that we're living in right now, with the lockdown, with coronavirus, with people dying, with um, you know, to to read uh, Buddhist texts. Um, can be very, very instructive and, and, and helpful. And so um, I think as a writer, you tend to use what's in your mind at any one time. And because that's something that I do think about, I suppose it just seems sort of naturally to filter into, into my characters. The other thing about Vincent Cain's Buddhism is that Buddhism is about compassion and about feeling. And in a way, uh, that's quite at odds with a lot of police work, or at least a lot of crime stories. Um, a lot of detectives and cops are hard men who feel very little. Vincent Kane is the opposite. He feels too much. And that's why he's a very, very reluctant cop. And that was a really important element for me. Every time he visits a crime scene, he's aware not just of the suffering of the person who has died or um, or, or, or involved in the crime, but also of the way that it impacts on everyone else and on their family. So I thought that that could be a, a really uh, fruitful um, avenue to explore. So Vincent Kane is an empath. He's an empath, exactly. And also he's a meditator. And you, you mentioned uh, meditation. And for me, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't make a big deal out of it. I don't go around, around in uh, saffron robes when people are watching, uh, Mari. But, you know... Um, Meditation is, is, is a tool that, um, that I employ. I, I, as you know, I've been a meditator uh, for, for many years. The thing about it for me is that, like a lot of authors, I've got a very busy mind. I think you've got one of those, haven't you? Yeah. Um, you know, I've got a mind like um, Piccadilly Circus in the rush hour. And so um, when I moved out of London down to the West Country, when you uh, guys were born 30 odd years ago, um, I. Um, got interested in meditation through through my mum actually uh, who is who is a meditator and um, I found it um, to be incredibly beneficial and so now I can't imagine really starting the day without 20 or 30 minutes um, quiet time and I know that's something that that, that, um, that you do too it kind of sets you up for writing it's a way of um, clearing your head um, and, um, and and helping you to focus so it's really useful I think without it um, my thoughts would be too fragmented and I'd suffer much more from, from stress. So, yeah. Um, and we, we, I mentioned there, I, I mentioned that ab about the humour. Um, so I found that it's not only is, is it packed with uh, suspense, the storyline, but it's really funny and, and touching. And what I'm interested in, I guess it's from a comedian's point of view as well, is when did you add the humour? Was that a secondary thing? Was that something you came in later to do? Or was it always... As soon as you were writing, you knew it was going to be funny. How did that work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I always, I always knew it was going to have a, a humorous um, aspect there, um, because um, I mean, you know, they're not they're not sort of clownish. I hope, but um, you know, coming back to Buddhism, I mean, humor is a very important part of um, uh, Buddhism. When you go to on a retreat, on a Buddhist retreat you'll find people laughing a lot. I mean, look at the old Dalai Lama. He, he, he never stops having a chuckle. 
Um, and, uh, and so humor is there. Buddhist jokes are absolutely fantastic. I'll tell you a few if we have time, but I won't. They're in the book. <laughs> there are plenty crammed in there. <laughs> Vincent Kane has these, these mugs <laughs> which drive Shanti absolutely insane. You know, they say they have a slogan on them and they say things like, um, there's no place like on and, and things like that. And uh, <laughs> that's quite a nice strand, but I hope it's done subtly. I mean, funnily enough, actually, someone was asking me the other day, what my influences were in, in, in these books. And, and, you know, they come from many things. I mean, at the moment, I'm writing a book, uh, writing the third one in the series, and I'm thinking a lot about Thomas Hardy, who was, you know, a great, great writer in this part of the world. Um, <laughs> actually, I think one of my strongest influences was Tintin. As a kid, I loved Tintin. I loved the array of bizarre characters. I love the way that they're plot-driven, but there are, there's also a lot of humour in there, a lot of quite surreal humour. So I suppose there's a, there's a, a little touch of, um, a, a, of that in, the, in them, but obviously these books are, are for adult, they're, they're grown-up books. <laughs> yeah, they are. I, I actually found the, the relationship with, between Shanti and, and Vincent Kane, it's very truthful, but it's very, it, there were a lot of times that I thought, oh, I do that. You know, that she's very, I think she can be, she, you know, she has a thing of, um, she doesn't like to be vulnerable and she doesn't like to be taken advantage of. And I think as soon as she feels, and even if um, she always has a kind of guard up and it seems it's only Vincent Kane that can gradually work that guard down. Yeah, exactly. I've just written a scene where, where, where uh, Vincent Kane, he's, he's in love with her really, isn't he? He's in love with her. She's resisting it like crazy, but he's absolutely in love with her. And, and, uh, I've just written a little scene where he, he, there are these little tiny crabs on the, on the beaches around here. And, and he's thinking her in terms of one of these tiny little crabs that they've got a, they've got a hard shell. But the reason they have a hard shell is because they're so tender inside. And, and that, that's a bit like Shanti, isn't it? She's a single mum. She's come out of a terrible relationship. Um, she, uh, she, her last case in Camden Town failed. Uh, and so she, she is quite vulnerable. She has her mum there. Um, who helps to look after her son Paul when when she's working? Um, but uh, yeah, inside it, she um, she's I think frightened of her softness because it makes her too vulnerable. But, I um, have that. I know what she feels like. <laughs> oh, what was it like for you when you were um, when you were recording the book? Because actually, funnily enough, I mean, one of the things I should say is that the character of Shanti, you 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 say you relate to her. Actually, I did think of you quite a lot when when I was writing her because she has a similar sense of dry sense of humour but it must have been weird for you to do her and Vincent Kane because there's sort of in, there's this sort of relationship between them did you sort of have to fall in love with a, a part of yourself when you were reading the book or is that um, a bit weird? No I think I'm really you know I come from an acting background and I, I really knew I understood how to develop and build characters you know the thing is these characters are so three-dimensional it's kind of, the job is sort of done with you for you when you when you pick up a script you know a lot is um you need to interpret a lot you need to bring yourself to to the characters but with with shanti and vincent and and the other characters they were sort of already done um i think one thing that i did when i think when you said which i understood oh vincent kane is a is me and then Shanti was me and then I had to was based on of course I had to really separate that and I think my my breakthrough I would say how I found Vincent Kane was that you had collected a whole load of brilliant photos of yeah. what he looked like and for me you know being very visual when you sent me those photos I thought oh now now I get it so when I played the two I mean, I must have looked, you know, completely mad. I think Gavin was, you know, <laughs> because because I was, um, you know, you literally stepping into their skin and yeah. stepping, you know, so it's well, very... Not literally, hopefully, but metaphorically, yeah. No, no. Dads um, are annoying, aren't they, mate? <laughs> eh? I said dads are annoying. <laughs> yeah, they are. Um, okay, um, so... Yeah, I was going to say, actually, Maddie, that, just, just to cut in there a minute, actually, that's a really interesting point because... Um, you, you were talking there about the sort of the visual quality of the of the books and, and I wouldn't mind just saying something about that because as I say I, I as you know trained as a as a painter as a fine artist and your mum's a painter your brother's a painter we're, we're um, you know uh, a visual art family really aren't we I, I 
studied at found the School of Art and then the Royal Academy. So I had a background as a painter. And then when I came to children's books, it was through illustration, really. And the writing um, came a little bit later. But I would just like to say something about this because it's quite interesting. When I'm writing, I think this may be unusual. Maybe every writer does this. I don't know. When I'm writing, um, I am uh, seeing a film in my head. I'm seeing a movie in my head. And when I'm writing well, it's almost like lucid dreaming. I have to smell and touch and taste and see what's going on. And that's why I do quite a lot of description, really, because I'm getting myself into a trance state, really, when I'm writing. I'm trying to create something that feels very real, that create a world that I can inhabit. And then you have this odd moment, I don't know if other writers share this, where you almost like a lucid dreaming, you enter that world that you've created and it's a magical, magical moment. You spend a long time trying to get there. But when it does happen, it's really quite wonderful. And in a minute, I know we're gonna talk about uh, possible television and film adaptations. Just a, a few days ago, I was talking to the producer and he asked, did you write these for television or for film? Um, and, and the answer is, well, yeah, that, that, <laughs> that was in my mind. But it's mainly that, I think, that I do, I do think um, visually all the time. And, and I think you, you probably do as well. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, with the book that I'm writing now, there's, well, mine's non-fiction, so it's slightly different. But there are moments of anecdotes and stories and all of that. And I find that I can access that by feeling first so once i get myself into what the whoever it is that i'm talking about was feeling at that time then i think they call it in the flow you know you it just flows you're able just to write um yes. yeah no i i do yeah. understand i mean i i think of like i think of writing as i've never done anything in my life that has such extremes when writing is going badly it's it's sheer torture and sometimes for no reason at all, you can fall into days or even weeks where nothing happens at all, but you've got to show up. You've got to turn up. You've got to keep pushing and pushing away, even though what you produce at the end of the day is absolute crap. You've got to stay with it. And then suddenly again, for no reason, it clears and then it's magical. And, and to come back to meditation, meditation's like that, bizarrely. Um, you, one sits and, and meditates every day and, and sometimes all you have is a head full of thoughts but you still show up and then every now and then for no reason whatsoever it clears and you enter this kind of uh, blissful state so uh, writing a bit like that well we're just about to finish but I would just like to touch on that there what did you let's talk about television and film yeah then <laughs> Well, I mean, this is really exciting. I don't know how much I can say right now because, you know, it's certainly not signed. But um, basically, um, uh, as, as I said, we've got a fantastic um, uh, agent and, and she has a wonderful team. And they, right at a very early stage, um, approach a fantastic uh, British production company who do some, I'm, I'm not going to name them, do some absolutely um, uh, classic um, uh, British television and uh, they've been pursuing this. They had an option on it, which they just renewed. And I um, recently spoke to them. And uh, I'm really, really pleased to say that they've now got a, um, uh, a film comp really good film company um, on board. And um, we're, we're trying to locate a, a writer now. And we've got someone in mind. So it's looking really, really promising. And uh, I mean, obviously, that would be absolutely thrilling and, and wonderful to see these characters sort of come to life, so long as it's done well, which I'm sure it would be. Which I'm sure it will, but yeah, we'll see when the ink is dry. Let's see, dot dot dot. Watch this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, so finally, where can people get hold of a copy of Art of Death? Well, um, you know, you, if you um, if, if if you're someone with um, low ethics, you can uh, get onto um, Amazon uh, and get one from there. But even better, go to your local bookshop if they're not open right now. Give them a call and they'll get one for you. Um, so Art of Death is the first one that's out in hardback, paperback and audio book read by the wonderful Maddie Anholt, a really, really good listen. Uh, and then uh, the next book in the series, Festival of Death, which I haven't mentioned, uh, which is set at the Glastonbury Festival. And it was supposed to coincide with um, the 50th anniversary of, of the Glastonbury Festival this year. And what happened? Nothing. Uh, so that's really sad. 
uh, but the book has been delayed somewhat, but it's coming out in, um, uh, in November uh, in Harbeck Festival of Death. And then the one that I'm just completing now, Solstice of Death, will be out a year or so after that, and that's um, Midwinter Solstice. I just want to give a quick shout to um, uh, Paul Blow, the artist who does the um, artwork, uh, fantastic artwork for, for these um, books. Um, I've just seen his cover artwork for Festival of Death. Absolutely tip top. Um, Paul's a good friend of mine, lives locally in Bridport and does an absolutely wonderful job. And it's really fascinating to see the, the way that these books look in different languages. There's the German one. Uh, have you seen that, maybe? Mm. <laughs> it's quite amusing because uh, they're taking very much a sort of English view of it. There's a double decker bus. We don't get too many of those on the Undercliff, but nonetheless, uh, uh, all good fun. And, um, and, and then the Czech one is very bloody and brutal and, and, uh, and kind of strange. Uh, but that's all good fun. Yeah, so there we are. My right. perspective. And where can where are you if people want to connect with you online? What are your where are you on social? Yeah, I'm mainly on I'm mainly on Twitter at Lawrence Anholt. Um, I am on Instagram, but not very often. Um, and I've got a website anholt.co.uk. You can you can contact me through that. Um, and um, or come and knock on my door in wonderful Devon, and right. uh, I'll give yeah. you a cup of everything. You you can find me at Maddie underscore Anholt. And uh, of course, if you are going to get a book from Amazon, if you do go down that route, if we could ask you to leave a lovely review, that's always. Oh uh, yeah, definitely do that. Do listen to Maddie's audio, but and, and follow uh, Maddie on, on Twitter and Instagram and have a look at some of her, her comedy and her short films. There's, uh, I mean, it's not really relevant to what we're talking about here, but um, a short film that uh, Maddie did recently called Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, uh, it's about five minutes long. Uh, Maddie stars in it, and uh, it's uh, absolutely brilliant. And, uh, and just well nominated for the Palm Springs yeah. comedy shorts. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. that's not what we're talking about. No, 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 lovely no. to chat to you, Dad. Yeah, yeah, lovely to talk to you, Maddie. Thank you, darling. <laughs>